Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Sylvain Lézé from the Department of Aeronautics at Imperial College London, and this is a new episode of the Turbulence at the Exascale podcast. And the aim of this podcast is to gather the view of the community regarding exascale computing for turbulence and what are the challenges and opportunity associated with exascale computing for the study of uh, turbulent research. This podcast uh, has been designed in the framework of a UK program called Excalibur, which will run until 2025. And the Excalibur project is led by the Met Office, the UK Atomic Energy Authority and the UK Research and Innovation. And its aim is to deliver research and innovative algorithm developments to harness the power of exascale computing. So the first stage of this project uh, is uh, based around a working group that are focusing on various software to investigate various type of problem. And I'm the lead of the turbulence uh, working group. And this podcast will help us to better understand uh, how to efficiently use exascale computing for turbulence research. I also led the UK Turbulence Consortium, um, which is a group of academics and researchers from the UK uh, who use high performance computing to study uh, turbulent flow. So there is a strong connection between the UK Turbulence Consortium and this Excalibur working group on turbulence at the exascale. So today our guest is uh, Professor Nilajan uh, Chakraborty from the University of Newcastle, where he heads the Fluid Dynamics and Thermal System Research Group. So uh, Nilajan research interests include direct and large dissimulation of uh, turbulent uh, combustion flows, uh, combustion modeling, uh, natural convection of uh, new Newtonian fluid. And uh, the reason why we have uh, Nilajan today is because he's also the lead of the UK to, uh, Consortium of uh, Reacting Flow and is very active in uh, producing uh, software development and new knowledge about turbulent flow but with some uh, chemical reaction. So this is uh, uh, slightly different than what we do in the UK Turbulence um, Consortium. So uh, good morning, uh, Nilajan. Good morning, Sylvan, and thanks for inviting me. It's a, it's a great pleasure to have you around and uh, to have a chat with you about um, what you are doing. And so I'm going to uh, crack on and start with my first question. If you can uh, briefly introduce yourself, um, where you are from, what you have studied and where and your previous position so that our uh, uh, people listening to this podcast uh, can know you better. Thank you. So uh, I was born in India in a city called Kolkata, which is on the eastern part of India. So I grew up there. My schooling was in that city. I went to one of the major universities in Kolkata called Jadavpur University. That's where I did my bachelor's degree. Uh, you can understand the population of India was huge even at that point of time. And people uh, just could not study engineering or medical sciences if you wanted. So one had to go through an entrance test. So uh, I was fortunate to, to qualify for both engineering and medical, but I chose to deal with uh, non-living things because I felt that it was easier to deal with. <laughs> so uh, I studied mechanical engineering and at that, after finishing, my bachelor's, I think there is, was another entrance test to qualify for master studies. So I topped in my bachelor's and then there was an all India entrance test. I topped that as well. And that enabled me to study what I consider the best institution in India, Indian Institute of Science. I spent one of my best times of my academic life in that institution. Uh, I came first there as well, and then I started working in the uh, research and development division of GE, uh, General Electric. Meanwhile, I uh, qualified for Gates Cambridge Scholarship. It's the, uh, I was the first generation of Gates Cambridge Scholar. Uh, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation started to fund uh, students all over the world to uh, carry out postgraduate studies in Cambridge University. 
and I was very fortunate to get that scholarship that enabled me to, uh, to uh, undertake my PhD in direct numerical simulation of premix combustion under the supervision of Professor Stuart Kant in uh, Cambridge. Uh, following that, I did a, a short postdoc with Professor Nondas Mastrakos in Cambridge before joining University of Liverpool as a lecturer. Uh, I became a senior lecturer after uh, three, four years in Liverpool and then moved to Newcastle University as a professor of fluid dynamics in 2011. So that's my career yeah, so far. And yes, that's how things happened. Fantastic, great. Um, so now that you are, you have been working at Newcastle University for quite some time now. So what's the best thing about your job in uh, at uh, Newcastle University? What do you like most about your position at the moment? There are many things. There are certain generic things which are applicable not only for Newcastle University, wherever I worked. I obviously like my research, and uh, uh, Newcastle being my host. I'm certainly grateful to Newcastle University for giving me the platform uh, because, well, when we, act, I know that very often people actually see the publications in a cynical light, but it's, it's whenever you get the reviews, very often it challenges you. It gives you uh, sometimes different uh, scope to think about it when you actually present your ideas within the university in another uh, community, they actually ask you certain questions which basically pushes you to think that how you can communicate in your, your research to another community. So the diverse community in Newcastle University certainly pushes me for that. Uh, when I moved to Newcastle University, uh, I was given the job to lead the fluid dynamics and thermal systems research group. I was at that time the youngest member of the group, but I was told to lead that group. <laughs> group. And I'm certainly grateful for the staff members to actually helping me and uh, co uh, cooperating with me. Uh, things have moved on since then and uh, uh, people retired, some restructuring happened in Newcastle. Uh, those members have moved to the mathematics department as a, uh, a result of, uh, but I lead a young dynamic group. It took me some time to actually develop that group. Uh, I am very proud of my PhD students and the, uh, the, uh, the culture that prevails within our lab. Uh, and that is not an individual achievement. We need help. We need cooperation from different people, colleagues, students. And I'm not only going to talk about the people who are involved in computational research. It's a, it's a, it's a achievement of the whole group, uh, the experimental uh, academics, experimental uh, uh, PhD students, postdocs also contribute to this. So uh, I really like the diverse research community. Uh, you have to actually communicate your research into those communities. Uh, there are obviously challenges because you cannot expect that uh, everybody will understand about our research. Uh, uh, there, are, there are milestones to be won. For example, when I moved to uh, Newcastle University, there was no high performance computing facilities uh, at that time in Newcastle. Uh, we became part of a consortium uh, called N8 that used to have a supercomputer, which was shared by eight Northern universities. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that led to a culture change in Newcastle. And effectively, uh, Newcastle came out from N8 uh, supercomputing at some point, but uh, by that time, the background work was done. And now we have our uh, uh, supercomputing facility within the university which I consider as a big culture change and a big shift in the mindset. So uh, all those things, yes. 
very good. Oh. Very nice, very nice story. So uh, I, I'm wondering, how did you become interested? So you, you started studying um, mechanical engineering, but then you're starting focusing on um, reacting flows and also you became interested in high performance computing. So I was wondering, how did you become interested in, in studying um, turbulent reacting flows using high performance computing? Yes, uh, you can understand that that was part of my PhD uh, research area, but it, it started before. So in the master's, when I was doing master's in India, uh, we had to do a number of courses. And uh, one of the course was experimental method. And my, uh, my thesis topic was related to uh, computational well, research is essentially I came to combustion from the heat transfer background. Uh, my, my job was to uh, uh, to actually model turbulent marangoni convection. It's a surface tension driven convection process in molten metal pools, um, and that's what my master's project was on. I still work on that area. Uh, it's not the main thrust, but I still have interest in that. But I also had a the subject on experimental men, mental method. And you can imagine the experimental infrastructure probably was not the great at that point of time. And uh, in that particular lab, and uh, you had to rely upon several people to, uh, to have a success in an experimental campaign which I did not like. <laughs> in computation, I can actually do whatever I like within my constraints. Um, I don't need to rely upon so many people. So that basically changed my mindset to go into the computational research. Now, I'm pretty sure you can um, uh, appreciate that uh, when I started, it was not high performance computing. Yeah, it, it, yes. it was it, it, it was sequential uh, programming thing, and you don't like the time you have to wait to get any meaningful result. So obviously, that led me to towards high performance computing. Reacting flow is something which I never studied. I learned as a process. Uh, and that started when I was working in G because I was mm -hmm. uh, working for G power systems sometimes, G auto, uh, uh, more on gas turbine, which is, was serving gas turbine industry, sometimes automobile industry. Uh, so my interest in reacting flow started then. And that's what I actually uh, wrote in my application when I was uh, making application for Cambridge University PhD. And then the, when I started working on direct numerical simulation, it had to be HPC. Of course. Uh, uh, and uh, that's how the Jardi really started uh, from that point on. And you can imagine uh, things have changed massively since then, um, I think. We are at exciting times. It's a very important juncture in the in the UK. Uh, I think exascale computing is in the horizon, but at the same time, it is important to realize, and I am pretty sure that you are on the same boat that uh, in 1990s, many of the university supercomputers in the UK was in the top list. Yes. Uh, and unfortunately, that is not the case at the moment. Um, the uh, percentage share of our national supercomputing facility that was available for uh, the national consortium, like UKTC, UKCTRF, uh, that has also gone down. Absolutely, uh, yes. Uh, and that brings challenges as well. Uh, uh, how one can actually remain internationally competitive. So uh, 
I think that yes, there is a, there is hope that exascale computing is coming, but at the same time, I think we need to be a bit careful about how to remain internationally competitive in this uh, field. I think the short term answer is our international collaborators or tapping into other facilities. It can be through place, it can be through our Japanese collaborators, through our American collaborators, so that we can actually access those machines. Uh, UK is still forefront of turbulence and turbulent reacting flow research in terms of generating ideas. Uh, so if we can have hands on the simulation data set, I think we can do a lot and we can still uh, still lead in these areas, but we need to be conscious about the challenges and potential difficulties. So uh, it's very interesting what you're saying. And uh, so it's going to be my next question. So do you think at the moment in the UK and in your, in your community and also for your research, do you think that you already have the, the, the software and the tools and the algorithm to study uh, turbulent reacting flow at uh, exascale? Or do you think you need to do a big effort in software development or, because you said you have the idea uh, in the UK, uh, you have the ideas, that, that's fantastic. We, we know that we are missing uh, computational resources. But what about the, the software? I think certainly, Lee, I don't think any community is fully ready. I think, think, uh, I think that's a fair uh, yes. assessment of the situation. Uh, we have something uh, based on which a plat we ha basically have a platform. And if that your platform is a good, good platform, you can launch good things from there. I think, uh, we have some codes which are used for large scale simulation in our community that is comparable to any other code, uh, any other uh, code in a countries like US or Japan or um, in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I just mentioned these countries because uh, very good research in, in turbulent reacting flows are conducted in this country. I also include France there. Uh, now, that part is there. As a part of uh, uh, a recent EPSSC project, we have been working on adaptive mesh refinement on a new code called Hemish, uh, which can potentially be useful for not only for uh, the reacting flow community, you can use it for the turbulence community as well. But in the reacting flow community, you often need to capture a particular front. So it helps a lot. So I think that is coming along and that is going to be ready. But what about actually adapting the code for the future architecture? What about the IO operations for large scale computation? Uh, what about actually taking advantage of hybrid infrastructure, uh, uh, computational infrastructure? All those fronts, we need uh, advancements. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, that is obviously going to be a dynamic process. I don't think, think that uh, this UK CTRF funding is until 2023 for this round, uh, but I, I don't think it is going to happen only within this period. It is, it has to, the process has started. The momentum needs to be sustained within uh, that direction. We also have to be very, very conscious about what is happening in the countries, other countries, for example, US who already invested in exascale computing a long time ago. So we need to actually, uh, learn the lessons from our collaborators. And uh, I think many things are common because effectively the governing equations that we are solving, uh, for example, within your community and my community is effectively the same. 
it, it is probably also to a large extent, uh, some of the challenges are sim similar in the mesoscale uh, consortium as mm -hmm. well. Uh, so I think uh, there is a cross-disciplinary approach or effectively exchange between different communities is going to be crucial because there is no point in actually duplicating the same things in absolutely uh, in three different forms or four different forms uh, in term one major challenge that i can see that is to educate people educate the community to take advantage of this now certain universities are in a better position because they have a long history of high performance computing and the hierarchy understands the necessity of that uh, it's not the case for all universities uh, so i think as a community we also have to uh, kind of do a role of campaigning within the 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 broad community so that people understand the value of exascale computing. Now, coming closer to home for our community, we need to understand that, that as we don't have adequate, well, the, the amount of computational resource that we have is not really adequate to cater the needs of the community. And I'm sure that's happening in UKTC as well, whatever, uh, Absolutely. Re whatever request you get, it is not same as whatever allocation you ha have at your disposal. Uh, so we have been giving people a fraction of what they wanted. And when that is fine once or twice, but when it happens on a regular basis, it starts to actually curb people's ambition they start to actually ask an amount which is more realistic from the point of view that they can get that allocation. Yes. As, uh, now, it is going to be a big jump from that mindset to go for a really big scale, massive scale computation. And uh, it, it is not only a big leap for the investigators, it's a big leap for our PhD students, postdocs as well. It's, I will claim it is a bigger leap for them. Now, whether we have all the, the, the during the whole process, whether we have filled in all the gaps, I'm not sure yet. I, I think, People need to actually understand the challenges. People need to use the, the tier two machines, tier one machines, tier zero machines. But before you go to tier zero machine, you need to know how to actually deal with things in tier one machine or tier two machines. And whether that progression is going to happen in a natural way, I'm not sure yet. I'm, and I think there is some work to be done in that respect. And and a change in mindset is important as well. Uh, I'm giving you a simple example. Uh, very often, people actually compare a computational research grant with an experimental research grant. Uh, and you know very well in the computational research grant in the UK scenario, your computational time effectively is given to you, but that has a notional cost associated with it. Yes. But it, very often in university accounting system, that notional cost is not added on top of your grant value. Whereas if you are talking about an experimental grant and if you want to buy an equipment, that money is reflected in your grant value. Yes. Yeah. So if you need to actually compare what a computational uh, grant really is then you have to actually add that notional cost on top of it, it and then you can compare like to like scenario now i don't think this is appreciated enough across the universities and so 
in order to actually start the process, the universities and the hierarchies will need to actually understand that high performance computing is important. Exascale computing is, the, is in the horizon. And we need to obviously communicate what benefits exascale computing can bring. Uh, and when that happens, I think the gaps that we men I mentioned that uh, I think they are going to fill up naturally because there is an incentive, there is a push in that direction. I think uh, very often you know that, that uh, computational technicians who are supporting us and who are effectively needed so that we can do things properly every day, they are not always as appreciated as they want. Uh, I, I, hope I agree with you. I mean, uh, it's funny you mentioned that because uh, yesterday um, there, there was a big uh, Excalibur um, uh, meeting and the topic of discussion was about the research software engineer and research software engineering in particular. And the, the main conclusion is that uh, there was no um, obvious uh, career path for research software engineers and they need to be more uh, rewarded with their research and with um, the software development that they are doing. So I think this, this is something that uh, hopefully is going to be addressed in the next few years um, in the UK. Uh, EPSS started that process a few years ago. I think we already have few research software engineers, but it's, it's not sufficient for uh, uh, serving all the communities. And as you have mentioned that very often university hierarchy does not understand where actually research software engineers fit in the, yes. in the whole structure. But, but if we need to take advantage of exascale computing, I think they are going to play a very, very important role. Uh, if I, we look, I agree with you. Uh, uh, and unless there is a good career path, there is a, a adequate reward at the end, you can't motivate people to take into that path. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty sure I'm preaching to a convert here, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, uh, but, uh, but these aspects need to be addressed. And, uh, and it's not a issue of a particular university. I think throughout the UK higher education sector, we need to actually address that. Yes, that's that's very important. I fully I fully agree with you. Um, in, in this uh, in this discussion, you mentioned um, I mean the benefit to society of having uh, some exascale uh, computers. So um, for your community, I would like to ask you what are you going to be able to do with exascale computing that you are not able to do now with uh, petascale computing? Well. Uh, more computational power effectively means higher Reynolds number. So that you are basically coming closer to the reality. Mm -hmm. you, it also means that uh, you can actually ad adequately address the multi-physics problems. Uh, uh, very often we need to actually really compromise on the details of the uh, the modeling of multi-phase behaviors. So if I want to actually simulate what happens in a real gas turbine uh, combustor for spray combustion, you can actually do full details of the atomization process and its burning process. And it's not easy to do that, you, one needs to make several assumptions at this stage. You can actually relax those assumptions to make things more realistic. More realistic you make these things, then you get better models for prediction of uh, industrial phenomena in this kind of scenario. There are other areas where you can actually uh, address which are not traditionally turbulent reacting flow areas, but there are, is, a huge degree of uh, cross-sectionality uh, 
nowadays people talk about biofabrication. A lot of biofabrication is actually reacting flow. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is not combustion, but it is reacting flow nevertheless. And obviously flow takes place under turbulent condition. And that often includes multi-phase behavior. Uh, so if you bring all of those together, you can consider about material science because sometimes uh, you, uh, you generate certain particles which are very, very important and they're extremely costly particles and that is made based on the combustion process. Now, if you're thinking about a simulating particle formation, we are talking about a multitude of multi-physics phenomena. Uh, and these things you can actually do with exascale computing because you are not talking about only modeling of turbulence or capturing the turbulence without any uh, approximation. You are talking about agglomeration. You are mm -hmm. talking about fragmentation. You are talking about how uh, particles are carried by the fluid and how the chemical reaction and the heat release effectively affects all those behaviors. Uh, so, so, it, it, so I think we can certainly broaden our horizon. We can go for device scale simulations. So you really, really need to, uh, you don't need to really rely so much on the models. Uh, so uh, our fuel landscape is changing. We are moving from the hydrocarbon fuels to, to hydrogen, but hydrogen behaves very, very differently in comparison to uh, hydrocarbon fuels. And uh, it can give rise to certain undesirable phenomena like flashback. Uh, uh, our combustors are made uh, smaller in size. So uh, previously, if you look at the traditional turbulent reacting flow literature, there is very little information av available on uh, flame wall interaction. Uh, you will see major part of the turbulent reacting flow literature has nothing to do with the wall, which is very different from your community. You think in terms of yes. boundary, boundary layer flows, but once you start to actually analyze the, the interaction of flame with a uh, wall, it's a very, very interesting thing. And all the usual things which people take for granted, like log law, based on which wall functions are formed, all those things break down. And, okay. uh, uh, and this is an area where uh, it is not only important from the, from the point of view of the turbulent reacting flow community. If you think in terms of what happens because of the heat transfer within the boundary layer in this kind of scenario, if you think in terms of the hybrid Rans LES approach, and uh, th these approaches are in infancy. It, there are lots of uh, advancements to be made in terms of quantities, like if we go for fine-grained information, uh, scalar dissipation rate modeling, and so on and so forth. And, and very little work has been done. And you understand very well that as you come close to the wall, your resolution requirement increases. If you want to go for realistic Reynolds number, you need huge amount of computational power. Uh, that is true even for non-reacting flows, but on top of that, you need to actually resolve the flame that increases your resolution requirement further. Uh, uh, and increasingly, we'll start to use things like microcombustors, drones, where you can, uh, for these applications, you will have inevitably flame wall interaction. Very little information is available. So all these exciting areas, one can actually explore with exascale computing. I will also say that because of the carbon neutral economy, you have to actually rely upon several carbon neutron fuels. I mentioned about hydrogen already. Mm -hmm. I, uh, hydrogen in the boundary layer can actually give rise to flash, flashback and that effectively give rise to flow separation. Again, the modeling is nowhere yeah, yeah of uh, uh, there. But in addition to hydrogen, people are burning ammonia, people are burning biogas, people are burning biofuels uh, like biodiesel. And the chemistry for those 
fuels uh, are not small mechanisms. They are large mechanisms. If you have to do something useful for uh, the engineering prediction for our evolving fuel landscape, we need to actually have high computational power to address the combustion behavior for those fuels because nothing much, yeah, well, nothing or not much is available in the literature to address those. So if we have to actually design a combustor based on those fuels or some kind of flexible fuel operation, we need that resource. And what's the best um, strategy or what's the best algorithm to study all these new um, processes? I don't think, think in terms of the algorithm, I think all the, all the challenges of exascale computing that we discussed, uh, they are generic. We need to have all of those, but I think given what the situation is going to be, at the moment what we are using effectively most of the time is a kind of explicit time marching kind of thing with mm -hmm. compressible, compressible code. Some of the people use low mark assumption, they're using implicit time marching. I think if we are going for the, the more exotic fuels, very likely the some of our chemical mechanisms are going to be stiff. So we need to have a combination of implicit and explicit methods. So okay. Implicit, implicit method for stiff chemistry uh, mm -hmm. part. Uh, so some degree of operator splitting method in addition to the, the, the explicit time marching for the, the fluid dynamic variables might be required. So that's that kind of combined approach. I think AMR, adaptive mesh refinement, is going to be certainly necessary if, because if we, uh, immersed boundary techniques will be uh, necessary to deal with more complex geometries. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if we want to do a device scale simulation using DNS or, or very highly resolved LES, we need to actually uh, invest on these techniques. Great. Or, and I was wondering, uh, in your uh, in your community, are you using um, high order methods or yeah. yes? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so the DNS code which we use most of the times, uh, it is tenth order central mm -hmm. dif difference for the internal grid points, and uh, as you come close to the uh, the boundary the order of accuracy gradually decreases to one-sided second order or fourth order, depending upon which code you are talking about. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you something. Um, if there is one thing about high performance computing that you could change today, um, what would it be? Well, uh, if you look at the flop to memory bandwidth and flop, flop to network bandwidth ratio, uh, uh, they are increasing immensely over the decades. Uh, uh, if you look at the latency aspect of flops to, to network latency or band uh, memory latency, it's also increasing. I think the ideal scenario is a balanced situation. Uh, uh, that's something if it can be changed, obviously it will be useful. I think uh, memory aspect is certainly going to be a major aspect because uh, in the DNS community, you produce big data. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that, that, that data itself uh, is not sufficient. Uh, very often you need to actually go back and mine that data. Uh, I, uh, have been discussing uh, similar things with uh, Charles Molinik. I am sure you know Charles yes, very yes, well yes, yes. Uh, from STFC. And he was showing some uh, on the fly post processing. Uh, I certainly think that, yes, the people who are doing direct numerical simulation uh, at 
a very famous person in our community, Thierry Poinceau, uh, once mentioned that people need license to do direct numerical simulation. They need to know what they are looking for in order to carry out DNS, because otherwise you can create lots of data, but they are not necessarily going to be anything useful. I appreciate the point, uh, but at the same time, some of the post-processing comes as an afterthought. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so I don't necessarily think that on the fly post-processing will solve every problem. Yes, maybe we need to go for some on the fly post-processing, uh, much more than what we are, we have been doing, but very often whatever you see from that, that essentially makes up your mind that what to look for. Yes, and and I that's the you. and that's the one of the major advantages of direct numerical simulation data. It, it's a resource. You you can actually mine that resource depending upon which angle you are coming from. Uh, so it is not only about generating the data, how to archive that data, how to actually really, uh, make this, how to visualize that data. Bigger the HPC, large, large scale HPC becomes essentially visualizing that data, post processing that data become, uh, they become more challenging. And that's something which I don't think any community fully uh, grappled with. I think we need to, uh, if, if there is an easier way of dealing with that, I would love that. There are some work uh, so in the US uh, where people actually they try to somehow compress the data. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they, instead of uh, solving every variable, they try to actually solve, uh, save some key variables. And as a post-processing exercise, they can actually generate that. Uh, uh, these are not fundamental research, but they're very, very important research. And, uh -huh. and, uh, and it is done in collaboration with computer scientists and CFD practitioners. Uh, I don't think that marriage has taken place completely in the UK yet. And yes. I think, uh, and I think uh, that aspect is extremely important. And I have, I've, I've seen that uh, US DOE funded research in these areas. Yeah. Uh, 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 I can't, can't see these kind of things immediately in the UK funding landscape, but I think this, uh, it has a huge mileage. Uh, so I agree yeah. with you. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. I'm conscious of time, and so I'm just going to uh, ask you one uh, one last question. Uh, is uh, can you tell us more about um, what's going on in the UK uh, consortium on uh, turbulent tracking flows? How many members do you have, and uh, how how the consortium is working, and things like this for those who who don't know um, the consortium. So it's, it gives a collaborative platform uh, for all, all UK academics who are interested in computational modeling of turbulent reacting flows. Uh, it doesn't mean that people who are working on laminar reacting flows, but if they have some relevance to the turbulent flow, they are also involved in this consortium. Mm -hmm. uh, Initially, we started with 30 plus. Uh, we are, in terms of the members, in terms of the named investigators, we are close to 50 now. Uh, uh, so the membership increased over time. Uh, in terms of the, most of our users are early career researchers, PhD students, mm -hmm. postdocs. Uh, obviously, we also work and we access the supercomputers ourselves as investigators. Uh, we run regular meetings. It's very similar to UKTC in that regard. Uh, generally what the plan is, and to some extent it got affected by this COVID related lockdowns. Uh, in this funding cycle, we have four annual meetings, the whole plan 
was to run first and second one as normal annual meetings. And we generally invite our impact advisory panel members who are from different countries. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have experimentalists so that they can give an alternative perspective to us. We have uh, representatives from Rolls-Royce, Siemens, Shell, uh, an SME called uh, Renuda. Uh, so we get different persp industrial perspectives as well based on their requirements. And they give us comments about uh, which way we should go or whether we are addressing some of the industrial needs or not, or what, whether we should actually change our focus, this kind of things. So we need to produce an annual report for EPSSC, but that annual report uh, goes through uh, post-mortem in, in that impact advisory panel meeting. We actually utilize that meeting for that purpose. Uh, and, uh, and that in turn actually guides us how to run the proceedings in the next year. Uh, our plan is to run the last two annual meetings as conferences. Uh, that's what we did even in the previous funding cycle. And uh, at least for the final meeting in the current funding cycle, whatever is going to be presented, uh, based on that, we will have a special issue in a, one of the reputed journals on turbulent combustion. Wow, okay. uh, uh, we did that last time in combustion science and technology, and that was about about 17 papers were submitted and ultimately it was i think 15 papers got accepted after and each paper was reviewed by three uh, reviewers at least so uh, so it was rigorously reviewed it's not just a uh, easy uh, publication uh, so uh, that's how we generally run it we give uh, travel funding as well uh, for PhD students, postdocs, mm -hmm. uh, for uh, presenting their paper, which uh, arose as a result of the activities within the consortium. Uh, this year, obviously, that hasn't happened. Uh, uh, but we have 38 international uh, combustion symposium this year. Uh, that has a registration cost. So it's a very prestigious conference in our field. It's highly competitive, so the people who have their paper accepted the, uh, in that uh, conference, they will get the whole registration fee from uh, online registration fee from the consortium. Okay. Uh, uh, and uh, we we associate huge amount of importance in the um, in the training activities of our early career stuff. So <clears throat> in collaboration with EPCC, we sometimes actually arrange for the training schools. Uh, we try to actually coordinate that with our annual meeting so that uh, in terms of the time commitment, it is not uh, two different venues or something like that, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, so in my opinion, yes, it, the community has grown uh, the, the, in terms of the output. Based on last consortium, we are in the process of capturing the, the impact evidences at the moment. But based on the, the last uh, cons uh, uh, period of consortium, we had 400 plus papers uh, from that. Uh, they were all in very good journals. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think it was about 10 million pounds of research council funding altogether from the consortium members. It's always difficult to actually leave, uh, find a, the actual amount for the industrial funding, but the indication is, is about similar amount, 10 million pounds of industrial funding. And a number of our PhD students and postdocs are in either in, in 
are well established in either academia or industrial positions. Uh, I think that's that's an uh, an aspect of impact which is often overlooked, and uh, I think it's very very important because uh, when I started using HPC, you asked me. I I presented in uh, the combustion consortium at that time as a PhD student, and in some way I am an living impact case study for the consortium model. I started uh, as a, a student user of the computational time of uh, combustion mm -hmm. consortium. I never thought at one point I would lead that. And, and here we are. Here we are. <laughs> one of the advantages of this, and I'm pretty sure you experienced that as well, that as you are allocating the computational time, you have a broad overview of whatever is happening in yes. the community which is very, very useful. And the second thing is when I go to international conferences, I actually see the students who actually got the computational time, not necessarily my PhD students, PhD students from other institutions, yes. uh, they are presenting and they're presenting good work and you feel very proud of, about this. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, uh, they also know you because of the interaction. So it almost feels like when you go outside and, uh, and if you look at the UK community, it is like a big family. And, and, that, and that togetherness is something to be cherished. Very good. That's, that's a very, very uh, nice thing to have indeed. I, sorry, I said I, I do not have more questions, but I have one last question. Uh, oh. Just a, a small curiosity. What is the topic of your next publication? Next publication. <laughs> <laughs> there are few which are uh, happening together. Uh, one of the things which I told you about uh, the flame wall interaction and what yeah. the uh, what flame does to the boundary layer. Uh, we are working actively on one of those things, and I gave you some hint the well established uh, laws which we. Yes, well, which we take for granted very often, uh, uh, either is, which has become textbook material or we actually use it in the kind of well-established wall functions they break down and okay. how they how they behave and why they behave in the way they behave. Uh, that's what we are exploring. Uh, so I'm excited about that. Um, Great. Fantastic. That's a nice way to end this um, episode. Thank you so much for your time no, and for your input. Uh, no, thank you for, uh, for uh, inviting me and uh, thanks for nice questions. And thanks uh, for it, was, it was really nice to talk to you and uh, we wish you all the best for thank you. Well, with the UK uh, Consortium on Reacting Flow and for all your research. Thank and you. um, yeah, so this podcast will be made available on the UK Turbulent Consortium website. There is now a dedicated section about this uh, Excalibur working group. So if you go on the uh, uktubulence.co.uk, you will find uh, all the information about turbulence at the exascale. So thank you again, thank you. Uh, Nina Jan. It was very nice uh, talking to you. And, thank you. Uh, everyone, thank you. Same here. Uh, see you at the next episode. Thank you. Thank you.